Okay, thank you. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I kind of invited myself <laughs> to Moscow because I promised uh, Konstantin in the middle of the competition that uh, if we win, I will come here and we will visit, we will present our solution uh, together. So he wanted to do this earlier, but I didn't let him. So, so sorry about this. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, this will be a description of uh, how we won this competition. Uh, I will mainly talk about how we prepared the data and Konstantin will tell you more about uh, the models themselves. So <laughs> this is our profiles from Kaggle. Uh, yeah, so both, uh, we, we both had uh, some pretty good experience in Kaggle competitions, and um, you can know Konstantin from how he uh, won the second place in uh, counting the sea lions recently. I don't know how many, have, have, you, uh, have you seen this competition? Right. <laughs> so. Um, at the time, before we merged, uh, Konstantin was the first one and I was the second one. So you can ask yourselves, uh, why merge at all if we are on the winning positions, right? And uh, in my experience, uh, the in the competitions, many things can happen uh, in the end of the competition, right? So we can be in the first place for the most of the competition just to lose the first place in the last two weeks because many people merge and form the teams and you lose money. <laughs> so I, I didn't uh, want to lose money, so I merged with Konstantin, the best guy I could. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the idea was pretty simple. We wanted to win this competition, and uh, I'm very competitive by nature. I always want to win competitions. So if you want to win competitions, you cannot start by saying, I won't win a competition, right? <laughs> you always want to win. If you want to win, you can. So this, this was... Um, our position at the leaderboard throughout the competition was the first, so we kind of um, dominated the whole competition throughout the whole uh, period, and it was very very nice nice thing. And we worked very hard on this competition. So just just to give you an idea how much we worked, uh, I think I we spent a couple of days uh, a day for about three months. So you can already see that it's a couple of hundred hours each. So it's a lot of time. <laughs> and thanks, thanks for uh, Konstantin's wife and my fiancé to be able to uh, cope with this. <laughs> so the point of the competition was to predict prices of uh, items. Most of the items on Mercari platform are used items. So if you make a photo of your uh, item at home, you can sell this item, right? But you don't know the price. The competition was to predict the price of the item uh, using all, almost all the information that you see here. O I say almost because we didn't have pictures. <laughs> Such obvious thing, but we didn't have it. Because this competition was a kind of a special one, and I will tell you about it about here. So the evaluation metric was selected. Uh, it's root mean squared logarithmic error. Um, it may sound complicated, but if you really uh, want, you can optimize uh, root mean squared error directly, because you just you just con you, you must convert uh, the target to a logarithmic scale and then use a normal model to optimize uh, the root mean squared squared error, right? Because many models optimize this metric directly. You don't have to use this complicated one, but you can use um, you can use the simpler method to solve this uh, problem. So this is a s some kind of pseudocode, how we can approach this kind of problem and use a simple model to solve it. So why logarithmic scale? You can see uh, two distributions of prices here. The first distribution is the row prices. Um, so we can see it's kind of skewed towards zero. And the second distribution is taken after taking the log of the price. You can see it's more like bell-shaped. It's a nicer distribution to model and that's why it was chosen for this competition. Okay, so I said that this competition was very different from uh, the previous ones. Uh, actually, I had a two-year retirement from Kaggle. I had enough <laughs> of Kaggle competitions and uh, because I didn't win the last competition and I was very sad. <laughs> uh, so I took a two-year break. But this competition kind of woke me up from the re retirement because it was so different from the previous uh, ones. It was different one bec dif different because uh, the, this was a code competition. This was a competition when you needed to create a script to upload, and then on Kaggle servers, uh, they run the script and make predictions. One trick 
you must only use uh, 60 minutes to do this, right? So I don't know how many <laughs> of you compete in, com the, in the competitions, but it's normal for models to train for weeks, right? <laughs> right? I, I know that some of you laugh, so I, I can see that uh, already you've trained models for a very long time. And this competition was different. You had to create models for ju just in one hour. In one hour, you needed to train and predict whole uh, the test set. And the constraints were kind of harsh because you had only 16 gigabytes of RAM, one gigabyte of disk, and f approximately four cores. I say approximately because uh, the platform itself wasn't as stable as we wanted to be, right? Because uh, we noticed that our, there are some differences up to like five minutes, plus or minus five minutes. If you had code that ran for 55 minutes today, tomorrow it can run for one hour and one minute. So it will not run. So this was, this was a real problem. We had uh, to run the models many times to achieve uh, this optimum time. As I have said, this competition was very different from the previous ones, and it had its advantages. The first advantage is that you don't have to create huge ensembles of models. You don't need to create hundreds of models to win this competition. You just need to create a few models. And this was a very nice, uh, because uh, I, I think you know that some of the competitors on Kaggle train hundreds of models. Right? They used stacking, so they ensemble the models together. They can use even two or three stages of stacking, and it's very complicated. And no company, I, I promise you that, that no, com no company will ever use such a model because it's unable, they will be unable to maintain such a model. So in this competition, was this, this was uh, impossible to create uh, such uh, big ensembles. The second uh, thing that was very important is team collaboration. Because there were two teams, I mean, there th you had only one hour to create whole solution. So if you had two people working on the same solution, you, you could not combine their solutions just by running them together, right? Because you don't have two hours, you have only one hour. So you need to collaborate on a very deep level. So you need to create a common code base. And we, together with Constantin, we had a common code base. We had a repository, uh, which we uh, open sourced today. Uh, so you are the first uh, group uh, to hear that. Uh, you can uh, see and uh, read this code. And uh, right, so we had to create uh, a common code base. Uh, and it was very nice because we had to merge early to be able to do this. I knew that this competition is very safe for me because um, late merging won't be as effective as it could be if you uh, merge in teams earlier, right? Because if you merge early, you can have time to integrate your uh, code together. If you do it one week before the end of the competition, it's impossible to integrate your solutions. One another factor advantage uh, is that the models we created were very small and very fast. So you could try very many solutions, many different ideas, and uh, most of them didn't work, <laughs> obviously, but some of them worked. And this is, uh, this I will talk about more. The disadvantages of the competition. Uh, a part of this competition was pure optimization, right? We didn't solve uh, a machine learning problem. We solved problems uh, with memory. We solved problems with multiprocessing in Python, and it's a very, very hard thing to do. I don't know if you had uh, you know, experience in Python and multi-core uh, operations, and it's terrible to optimize, especially multi-threading. It's very, very bad. So the part of the competition was pure optimization problem. So, but we had to do it in order to win. The second disadvantage is unstable platform. Uh, we had a um, kind of impression that uh, the platform on which we run our solutions changes in front of our eyes, <laughs> right? They, they even, I think they uh, put some life, life changes on, the, on, on this platform and we, we had to deal with this. And it, it was very, very uh, naughty uh, of Kaggle because uh, it kind of ruined competitions for some uh, periods of time. And there were, like, uh, on the discussion forum, there people wrote, oh, how can you break this uh, uh, nice competition by applying so some of the changes you did? Mm. Another disadvantage was that it was, it was a two-stage competition. What it meant in, in this context that Kaggle, for some reasons, known only for them, uh, decided to use five times bigger de test data 
in the second data uh, stage. Right? <laughs> so your solution could work for a test, that test set that, you, uh, that was the original size, but it, you cannot know how it will behave uh, using a uh, five times bigger data set, a data set which you didn't see. And uh, I think that uh, about one third of the teams uh, that finally uploaded their code were disqualified because they didn't manage to optimize their code for the second stage. <laughs> so it was a pretty huge deal for Kaggle, and I think um, for the next competition they must make this kind of better. Okay, so about uh, the Kaggle platform itself. Um, as I have said, the aim of the competition was to create a script. After we worked uh, uh, about one month into the competition, we had scripts that were 1,000 lines long. <laughs> and it's already very uh, important to maintain this kind of code. If you have a script that is 1,000 lines, you cannot easily maintain it. So we decided to split the code into packages, and then we create this kind of <laughs> trick that we used. We created a self-executable script, a script that uh, created a Python package and then extracted the contents of the files and installed this as a normal Python package. And it was a pretty big deal because we could you know, work on the solution as if we worked on a normal Python package. And it improved the work, uh, Im improved the maintain maintainability and improved the testing of our solution. It, it was very important to do. Yeah. Even, even the guys from Kaggle said that it was kind of uh, nice to do. I think in future competitions, they should uh, do it like as a standard. So we don't have to create one spaghetti uh, script, but you can uh, actually upload your solution as a Python package. The data itself wasn't as big as you can imagine because one hour is not enough to have a uh, you know, few terabytes of data. We had only uh, 1.5 million observations in the data set and only six uh, columns. So you can see that two columns were text, uh, another two were text slash categorical because you, can, you could use them both as uh, text and categories. And there we, we have uh, shipping, which was Boolean uh, value and condition ID, which was kind of like categorical but ordinal. Because the item condition you, you can obviously uh, create from new item to use item, and the states in between are almost new, used in 50%, and so on. Okay, this is how uh, an example of the item looked. I think Konstantin tried to uh, enumerate all the emoticons <laughs> that there were in, the, in this data set. It was kind of impossible. Uh, so we had to ki kind of normalize this text to some extent. I mean, the future extraction wasn't uh, such a big deal in this competition. We applied uh, standard methods to, to, uh, to this data set. OK. One other thing that is very important for me um, is not to use imperative approach when building models. Imperative approach in building models means that you mix together declarations of your, of your classes and execution, right? So you can see that... Oh, how to? No, I don't know how to use it, <laughs> sorry. Um, so you can see that in the on the left side uh, you have a declaration of a vectorizer. And on the second line you use this vectorizer. So your model is kind of split between declaration and execution. And it's really, really um, hard to maintain. It's much better, in my opinion, to create something like a declarative approach, when you first declare what happens, and then you execute the code, right? Uh, and uh, all our data sets, which we created for this competition, uh, worked uh, in this way. So we first declared what, how the data is transformed, and then applied uh, the uh, apply the data to these uh, transformations. So this is uh, an example of how a, a data pipeline like this can look. So we can see that um, it's composed of several parts, and each part kind of de is dedicated towards processing some parts of the columns. So you can see the first sub-pipeline deals with uh, columns that are name and item description. You don't have to take photos, it's, <laughs> it's uh, in a GitHub repository. 
<laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, it, it will be all, uh, we'll give you a link after, uh, after the presentation. Uh, so we can like read it uh, at home. <laughs> Um, so, as I have said, you have a single object that is a declaration of what happens in uh, the data processing pipeline. And it's very easy to maintain because you can hide, abstract, abstract away all the implementation details and you don't have to deal with this uh, state, right? Because in, in, for example, functional programming, you uh, say that you must be as lazy as possible. So you defer the actions as long as possible. So you don't do anything unless you need to do. And this is uh, this is like uh, going in this philosophy. Okay, so as far uh, as far as pre-processing of the data goes, uh, we didn't use much feature generation. I think uh, whatever feature generation we tried, it just didn't work. I uh, said to Constantine at one, one point that uh, uh, our neural networks uh, think that our feature generation is stupid because uh, <laughs> none of them worked, really, uh, or, or at least almost none of them worked. I think that is because uh, sometimes um, people underestimate their models. We think that m we are smarter than the models, and uh, uh, in most cases it's not true. <laughs> models can... Uh, extract features uh, much better than we can. So uh, I think it's a lesson for, for us that uh, just don't uh, overcomplicate uh, feature uh, extraction and feature generation. Just focus on the models, so use the right model and right approach and don't focus on feature generation. But we used some feature generation, as you can see, for text uh, preprocessing we use stemming, so we cut the suffixes of the words uh, we use bag of words approach with unigrams and bigrams. It's very standard thing to do, uh, with on or without TF-IDF. Uh, we used one-hot encoding for categorical columns. So you know, th these, I mean, techniques are very standard. It's nothing new for you. Uh, some some non-standard approaches were using bag of characters for name. It was very a, r a random idea. I just tried to use uh, trigrams of characters, and it worked. I don't know why, it, it just did. A another important uh, uh, feature that we created was because the data set was split among, you know, you had the name of the item, you had the description of the item, you had the brand name. And all those things are very similar, and you don't have to pre-process them se separately. So we decided to join name, brand name, and description together, and it was a very important trick in this competition, right? Because competitions are just bag, bag of tricks that you can apply, and this uh, trick uh, actually was used by us and by the second team. So you can already see that it was a kind of important one. Uh, another interesting uh, feature that we extracted, because I need to explain uh, how we um, kind of checked if our, our models work. Uh, we checked by evaluating the errors. If we saw uh, some items with big errors, we tried to analyze why the error was so wrong about these items. And we noticed that one of the reasons why the models were wrong is because people so, so sell uh, bundle items. So they did, don't sell one item, they try to sell as many as possible. So they women sell like 10 lipsticks, 5 uh, brushes, 10 creams, or so, and so on. And it's confusing for the model because uh, it expects uh, one item. And if, so if someone sells 10 items, it's already, you know, it's, it's very hard for a model to predict such uh, such thing. So we created something like a numerical vectorizer. When someone writes 10 lipsticks, it vectorizes um, 10 in the column when the lipsticks go, right? <laughs> Do you understand this? Because I, I know it's a, tri a tricky one. I mean, the code is in the, the GitHub repository, so you can check this out if you want. Mm, right, so another important thing, and Constantin will tell you more about this, is that we use Ensemble. We eventually, we use 12 models, but uh, using a three different data sets. Why uh, we did we uh, use 12 models? It's, it's because it was simple. We used three data sets and we had four cores. So on each core we trained one model. So that's why you can see that uh, if you train one model, you can get the performance around 0 0.4. If you train two, you can already see that the error drops one by one percentage point. It's a huge gain. So you know that uh, 
we, we all know that ensembling works. For this competition, we had to stop at four models per data set. Right. And why, we, why did we use three data sets? This is another question. Um, we use three data sets because it was much better to use uh, two data, set in data sets instead of one. So you can see here, in the first three uh, bars, there is a performance of uh, four models for each data set. Right? So you can see that using four models for each data set has performance around 38.5. But using uh, two data sets and eight models, the performance drops to our by around like one percentage point. And it's interesting to notice that uh, if you use 12 models, you can use 12 models with a single data set, and it's worse than using uh, two data sets. And the best uh, combination is obviously to use three data sets. So in the middle of, com of the competition, when we realized this, we wanted to create as many data sets as possible. So this was an uh, important thing uh, to keep in mind when thinking about how you create uh, your solutions. You not only diversify the models, you can only diversify, you, you can also diversify the data sets. And it's very important for this competition and I think uh, it was one of the reasons uh, eventually we won. Right? Because we used diverse approaches, diverse uh, data sets. Okay. And this uh, is kind of interesting uh, graph showing um, the performance over time of our team. You can see that uh, it's very typical for competitions, at least uh, in my experience, because you, you had some tricks to apply, and each of those steps is one trick, right? So you can see one trick is used uh, using sparse uh, neural networks. Second trick is merge our solutions, our both uh, solutions. So. Mm, so after you apply some trick, you fine tune it, and then you need to find another trick. So if you're uh, one tip, if you uh, want to compete in competitions, if you are stuck, just don't follow the same approach. Try to find out something different that works. Because uh, normally, if you are stuck for a long time, that means that you didn't find a trick that is uh, good for this competition. No, and that that is all for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mm. Um, okay, I'll continue with the uh, models. Uh, okay, as you can see, so the, the one of the major tricks that help us uh, at the uh, uh, closer to the start was using a sparse uh, feedforward network, and this is not something you commonly use. Uh, at least, mm, so this is unusual. Usually, like deep learning works great, but here. So this is like uh, this model is like a combination taking best of both worlds of uh, deep learning and classical approaches. So uh, we use like tricks uh, that help deep learning, but they also help with uh, old school uh, models. Uh, so how how does this model look? So this is pretty standard. So this is the only model kind we used throughout this competition at the end. Uh, this is a standard feedforward neural network on sparse features. So uh, on the left, uh, there are uh, example features. And um, uh, you can see that um, like one feature is, let's say, uh, is this item shipping or not? Uh, then features for one hot encoded words, and so on. And then we have uh, had actually uh, one more uh, layer, but um, it provided only a marginal uh, improvement. Uh, so uh, why why and uh, why use this model? Because this is this model is is not state of the art for anything. So for any kind of task, you can find a better model. But why did it work so well here? So we think there are several uh, things. First is that uh, this model was really efficient uh, to train. So we ha we didn't have a GPU. Uh, we had only a CPU. And uh, in the time that like uh, a recurrent network or convolutional network could be trained with uh, hidden size, so hidden size is uh, the most important parameter is uh, the uh, dimension of the first uh, hidden layer, uh, because the uh, the bulk of the capacity of the network is in this layer. The number of features is about uh, twenty hundred thousand, and 
Uh, so the capacity is mostly like mul uh, multiply this number of features by the size of the first hidden layer. And the data set is quite big, so it's one and a half million items. So model capacity is uh, really important. And the bigger the model capacity in this case, the better is your score. So uh, this model allowed us to have much uh, larger capacity uh, compared to uh, common deep learning uh, architectures. Uh, another thing uh, is well, equally important, I think, uh, in these data set feature interactions between different things were important. So if you say some, if you have some word in item description uh, and um, the meaning of this word depends on other fields, like it depends on the brand, it depends on the category. And uh, this model is uh, able to capture these interactions effectively because, uh, as you can see, Okay, as you can see here, for example, we have brand and we have name, and we we can have uh, we can capture the uh, interaction uh, easily. And it's not so easy to do in a recurrent network because usually recurrent network you process uh, text separately and create some representation of. Uh, name, create some representation of description, and then merge them together later. But uh, we could do also merge them uh, together in this network uh, only later, but this uh, degraded the score significantly. And another thing is that how could we get away with just one model? Uh, no, uh, this model on its own, um, if you just train it several times uh, and tune it properly, it create it has huge variance. And so averaging, just averaging several models, as Pavel showed, already gives you uh, a good score. And we achieved diversification not by uh, models, but by uh, creating different uh, data sets with uh, different features. Okay, so uh, note about training. Um, well, mostly it was standard, so we used an Adam optimizer. It is uh, really crucial because we want to achieve uh, fast convergence because uh, we want to train as many models as possible, and so we want to have as uh, um, not a lot of epochs. So we were able to uh, train just three epochs with Adam optimizer, and with SGD it would be not possible. And you can see that it is overfitting very badly, uh, so even after the first epoch. And if you so in at the top there are validation curves and at the bottom there are training curves. And if you look just at the uh, validation curves, you can see that we, uh, we uh, trained the model for it to overfit. So optimal performance was on the second epoch, uh, but uh, if you slightly overfit, that creates a more diverse ensemble. So if you average undefeated models, that doesn't improve so much. If you average um, perfect uh, converged models, then it helps. But if you ma uh, average overfitted models, then they, are, they become more different because each model converges to its own local uh, minimum. And another important trick was uh, doubling of the batch size after each epoch. Uh, it uh, made the uh, code run faster because the larger the epoch, uh, the faster, the more efficient are the metrics uh, operations. And another thing is that it uh, led to led to better overfitting. So uh, the small batches prevent overfitting, and large batches lead to more overfitting. And this is what we want here to diversify our ensemble. Okay, and there were also some tricks in the models. So first trick is very standard, uh, using Huber loss, uh, it is just shown in green. So uh, this loss works better, so it doesn't penalize outliers so much. So, uh, and there were quite a lot of outliers in this data set with bundle items and with some unreasonably priced items. So we don't want the model to fit them, we want to fit normal item items. Uh, another uh, trick is, so the, the task was to predict the price, so this is a regression problem. But uh, you could also solve it as a classification problem. Uh, we split all prices into 64 bins uh, of different, so, uh, uh, of different um, kinds of prices and ran uh, a classification. Um, uh, a classification model. So the model had to predict in which bin does this price fall. But if you do it naively and create a target as 
uh, one in the bin where the price falls and zero everywhere, this doesn't work so well because if the model is slightly wrong, predicts the nearby bin, uh, then it is penalized as much as uh, if it would predict a very far bin. So instead we create a soft target. Uh, at the bottom, you can so at the top you see just the histogram of the target value after applying the log transform, and at the bottom you see uh, prices, targets for uh, several items. Uh, first for one and a half, for two, two and a half, three, four and five. And for example, two is shown in orange, and so you see that uh, if we predict the central bin, this is good, but if we predict some nearby bins, this is also fine. And so this uh, we uh, combined this approach with uh, usual regression with Huber loss, and it uh, provided more diversity while still using the same model kind and the same uh, code base. And uh, another interesting thing is m related more to the data preprocessing. So most other our data sets had some uh, kind of uh, either TIF uh, vectorizer or uh, a custom vectorizer that uh, Pyle described. So this means that like some feature has a uh, value which is not one but some like number of times this word appeared uh, in uh, description. And, but it's also common in LLP to use binary uh, vectorizers, where you just put uh, one if the word occurred, no, no, doesn't matter how many times. And uh, so these are two different kinds of approaches. And uh, it is possible to convert a uh, TF-ADF uh, preprocessing result into a binary result. So you just convert any non-zero value to one. And it's possible to do this during training, so you don't waste time recreating all the features because feature preprocessing for 1.5 uh, million rows takes time. And so this allowed to create uh, uh, an extra data set uh, on the fly. Okay, and uh, another point is uh, efficiency of implementation. So as Paul said, it was uh, as much uh, about data science as about uh, making sure that you use the most of the resources you have. So we checked almost all frameworks for uh, how, how do they support this uh, model. So uh, for example, in PyTorch, while there is uh, sparse uh, metrics support, it, it doesn't really work. So, for example, the gradient for the sparse multiplication is not implemented, although the docs say that it should be. And, yeah, and one point, so if you use this uh, with dense features, so you could uh, pass dense features instead, but it's terribly slow. So we need to use sparse. So TensorFlow has good support uh, for this kind of stuff, but then uh, closer to the end, we discovered that uh, MXNet has even better uh, support. And the difference is that uh, so your, di uh, your data is sparse, and we're training in batches, but even if you take a batch of, say, 1,000 examples, this batch is still relatively sparse. And so the gradient uh, will also be sparse. And if you can maintain the sparsity throughout the optimizer and throughout the whole pipeline, then you can do sparse updates. And this becomes more efficient, especially with smaller batches. So uh, MXNet supports this uh, sparsity right to the end, and so it is much more efficient, uh, especially when the batches are small. Uh, Keras also has support for these kinds of models, um, uh, it's, mm, but it's using the same TensorFlow operation uh, under the, uh, 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 at the end. And also, actually, this model with sparse uh, multilayer uh, network can be implemented uh, by uh, using embedding in the first layer. So if you if we go back to that, um, so actually this is uh, mathematically the same as using an embedding of size uh, 256 in this case. And uh, so doing this embedding, then multiplying each embedding vector by the value of the feature and uh, summing them. So this, uh, so embeddings are in every framework, and this works in uh, every framework. But the problem is, uh, this is much uh, less efficient for this uh, kind of data uh, as opposed to using a sparse uh, matrix multiplication. Uh, okay. So at the end, we had. Oh, sorry. 
so at the end, we had uh, a model in uh, MXNet and a model in TensorFlow. And we used uh, one for one of our submissions and another for another submission. Because MXNet used to crash randomly and it was like new to both of us, so we didn't really trust it completely. Um, okay, another point about optimization. So uh, if you, say, want to train several models, you could uh, train one model and use all cores to train this model, or you could train one model on each core, but do that in parallel. And um, it turns out that the scaling from one core to four core is not linear. So if you use four cores, the, mo the code will not run four times faster. And especially for sparse networks, uh, the scaling is really, really bad. So it was much more efficient to train one model, to restrict one model to one core, and train, uh, train them all in parallel. So it was about 50% about uh, more efficient. But if you train uh, four models in parallel, then you have the problem with memory. Because, again, the data set is quite huge. And the bigger you make your data set, the more features you have, the better is your score. But the more memory you use. So we had to think about memory as well. And uh, for TensorFlow, it turned out that there is a, uh, a, f uh, a way to say TensorFlow to use uh, different, um, different thread pools for different sessions, and this allowed us to use threading. So this means that we keep uh, one copy of the data set uh, in memory, and it is shared memory by all uh, four threads, and they are able to use all cores. MXNet doesn't have this thing, so we had to instead carefully optimize the uh, to rewrite the data feed uh, pipeline to make it more memory efficient. And so for MXNet, we ran to oh, four processes. So this was also more risky because it was closer to the memory limit. Um, okay, and so at the end, we have these 12 models trained on three different data sets. And um, the way to merge them, so you could just average them. Um, this would work reasonably well, but what worked better was uh, making a weighted average. So for that we use the Lasso model, which is a uh, linear regression with uh, L1 penalty, and uh, we validated it on 5% of our data set uh, locally, and on Kaggle we use just 1% of the data set. And it worked. Um, so using this uh, extra 4% improved the score, and it didn't lead to any instability with, um, with uh, the weights. And as you can see, the weights of different models and different data sets are relatively, well, comparable. So we don't have any super bad models or super bad data sets. So they all bring their uh, improvement. Um, there are also, well, a lot of things that didn't work, like uh, we did, not well, many more didn't work, but some notable obvious things. First, we, uh, we tried to optimize hyperparameters with the grid search, and it was really, well, first it was hard to do, because if you improve one model or one data set, this doesn't necessarily make the ensemble better. And at the end, the hyperparameters that we chose just by, like, gut feeling turned out to be, like, good enough. So grid search didn't provide any improvement. And also, like, we have this old-school feed-forward neural network, but, well, there are ResNets, there are skip connections, a lot of tricks that imp should improve this, but for this data set, they didn't, so we tried them. Another interesting idea is a mixture of experts. So this is a paper by Hinton and his colleagues, and um, so this paper uh, says that you can increase uh, model capacity without uh, paying a performance penalty for that. You create an exp a different uh, model for different scenarios. For example, you there would be like one model for I don't know for uh, smartphones and another model for uh, for other kinds of items. And these uh, models would be selected. Uh, dynamically during uh, training and evaluation. And this allows you to uh, update just the model, just some models out of your mixture of experts. And in theory, it allows you to achieve a great uh, advantage with uh, computation and with model capacity. But in practice, um, it's, uh, we did some initial experiments. It didn't really show much improvement. And then it turned out that uh, TensorFlow lacks some support for some operations, 
that uh, with sparse uh, vectors, so at the end this didn't work unfortunately. And also tried factorization machines and other fancy stuff, but this uh, also didn't improve, it worked, but didn't improve the overall uh, solutions, overall solution. Uh, okay, so I think I'll s mostly skip this part, so uh, w while this um, so our final solutions had about uh, 2,000 lines of code, but it's actually possible to extract just uh, the main ideas from it and uh, in less than 100 lines of code. So we published a kernel that does this. And so the interesting bits about it, so first we like say that uh, an environment variable, mpnm threads to one. So you see that it's like not something that a data scientist needs to know in his day-to-day -day job because so it's some obscure detail that you could like learn on the formals or something, but like without this, it would run just three times slower. So, and you lose. Okay, so next, okay, we said, so this is very simple feature engineering part that just does the trick that uh, Powell mentioned of merging the uh, features uh, of name, brand name, and description into one field. Then again, this obscure uh, TensorFlow trick to allow scaling, to allow using uh, multiple threads from one, uh, multiple cores from one process. Then simple model definition in Keras, so you can see is very standard model, and and then uh, again this binary trick, which is also very simple to implement. Although here it's implemented in a lazy way by creating a copy, and not doing it on the fly. Um, okay, and, and then again the uh, the more features we had, the better. So we had like uh, one uh, hundred thousand features for name and text. And if we could like allow more, we would like to to do that. Like in gram range, also if we could take three grams, it would improve the solution even better. But the memory was limited. Um, okay, I think nothing interesting here. Um, okay, so about so this is all about our solutions. But uh, this competition was really so. What attracted me most uh, in this competition, besides the kernel thing which was new was also that it was not exactly clear which models to use so in many competitions like especially with images it is th there is established uh, uh, there are established models uh, you take this model you maybe tune it you uh, invent some preprocessing tricks or training tricks but uh, you know which model family you should use but in this case uh, you could use it was not clear which family of models would work best so uh, a ridge model, which is just linear regression with L2 penalty, uh, worked uh, reasonably well, although this the score was not perfect, but it, uh, it was used by many people. Then also uh, a lot of people uh, were successfully using uh, uh, recurrent networks and convolutional networks. So this is, well, basically state of the art in uh, text uh, processing. But in this case, first, there were severe compute limitations, and these, there were also categorical features, uh, which were very important, but w which these models didn't use efficiently. Uh, also, like standard light GBM, uh, it was much more popular than XGBoost. Uh, so it worked also reasonably well, but the problem is that uh, light GBM is really not efficient in the case where you have a lot of features and uh, a large data set, so you had to take extra care to prepare the data set and to compress the number of features for it to work well. And uh, maybe the most uh, wildly used and successful model family came from uh, uh, NTIP, uh, who shared, I think, maybe three or four weeks before the uh, end of the competition, shared his library and uh, a number of models which were the top scoring public uh, models uh, throughout the whole competition. So this was, uh, so Word Batch memory has, uh, Word Batch library has really efficient uh, preprocessing uh, primitives and it also had an FTRL uh, model which stands for follow the regularized leader. So this is an, uh, an optimizer like Adam or SGD and it's, it's implemented even in TensorFlow. And uh, this is a linear model and FM, FTRL is a factorization machine trained with this 
uh, optimizer. And uh, vectorization machines are really good at capturing interactions, which are important here. So this was probably the best scoring public model uh, available, and a lot of teams used it. And so let me like run through the uh, different solutions. So second base solution, uh, they were uh, a lot of things that they did were similar to uh, what we did. So they uh, also did some similar tricks with preprocessing. They also used the sparse neural network implemented in Keras, and they also used uh, fast text uh, neural network, and uh, also y they also used this trick uh, of doubling the batch size. So I think the main difference was that they didn't like, manage to train as many models as we could and as many data sets. So maybe like the major difference between uh, us and them is maybe in like optimization and also more, more tricks discovered. Uh, the third place solution was, uh, I think, very typical um, in the models they use. So a lot of like teams who got the gold used uh, uh, convolutional networks and a word batch uh, uh, factorization uh, machine model, because these two models both achieved good results on their own, and uh, they were very different, so they worked good in the ensemble. And he mentioned that uh, he spent a lot of time and effort on optimizing the code. And this is probably not something Kaggle wants, but if they like give us a lot of data and not enough time, then like to score well, you need to optimize. Um, okay, and another um, interesting magic feature from Sergei Feronov, who uh, finished uh, in the top um, in the gold, uh, was uh, so this feature. If you take any reasonable model and use this feature, then you already get a very good score. So for a single model, uh, 0.41 and less is a good score. And uh, so this feature is that uh, you uh, uh, use feature interactions between brand and name. And so if you have like, you just check the example. So if you have Apple and a phone, then you create a, a text feature, Apple underscore iPhone. So this means this uh, like directly uh, uses these observations that different words have different meaning depending on the uh, categorical fields. Uh, and so this is a great feature. There are um, one disadvantage is that uh, you um, you have a lot of features. So uh, because like the number of features is multiplied between uh, categorical and uh, text features, so you they could have like uh, sixty or oh, six hundred thousand features or a million of features. And the more features you you have, the better. But again, you have like me uh, memory constraints. Um, and another disadvantage is that this feature is really good, but if you, you uh, train different models with this feature, then they behave similarly. So they like give more power to the features, features than to the model, and you cannot uh, d easily diversify your ensemble. But it is a very nice and direct way to like ex exploit um, uh, the property of this data set. And Okay, yeah, so as I said, I think that I covered this. The only thing I didn't cover is that it was, uh, although we lay merged already with good scores, but um, almost all the ideas we presented here, we created after merging. So it was, mm, it we were really lucky that we uh, could uh, work well together and create a, a good solution by basically throwing um, most of the code we had, but combining ideas and uh, inventing new ones. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, any questions? So uh, the link, I think, oh, it's not here. Okay, yeah, we'll post the link to, to the forum, uh, the link to the code um, to the forum. Thank, okay. thank you, questions? <laughs> oh, go ahead. So guys, again, congratulations and thank you for a very informative talk. So my question is more about the teamwork. So how do you manage to maintain kind of a shared environment to like to uh, contribute? Uh, so did you use a Docker or did you kind of use a Docker file to like to work together? So and how did you um, actually maintain 
those constraints locally? So that's sort of question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I, I can answer one part mm -hmm. about the Docker and compute constraints. So uh, I, I used uh, the uh, Kaggle Docker image, but I also installed CUDA uh, into it, so I could train the model on GPU mm -hmm. uh, locally for faster iteration and then run it on CPU uh, to check uh, the time. Uh, about uh, how do we maintain the uh, constraint uh, of time. So uh, one thing is that due to platform instability, uh, if you target, like, uh, if you want to create the best solution, you need to run in like 55, 59 minutes. But if you try to do that all the time, then uh, you'll often time out. So instead, we try to maintain that our code runs for about like 40 minutes most of the time, and then like at the very end, we can just tune it up a bit and try to get a lucky run. And I think I'll let Pavel answer part about cold collaboration. Uh, yeah. Very good question, thank you. <laughs> uh, the code co collaboration, as I have said, uh, it was very important for us to maintain our code. Um, that's why we create a repository in which we worked as you would in your work. So we had our repository, we had pull requests into our code base, so it wasn't a really like commit to master kind of um, approach. Uh, so we tried to you know keep uh, the software engineering rules, uh, uh, I mean, Im as important as, as they can be. And uh, when I, I think uh, Konstantin said this before, that we <laughs> were really very lucky to com complement each other. Uh, Konstantin is excellent in uh, models in neural networks. Uh, I'm excellent <laughs> in data processing, I think. Uh, so we, we, can, uh, we could uh, actually mer merge our experience together. We had like uh, exchange over 4,000 messages on Slack. Uh, so that was a really important thing also. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> uh, firstly, uh, thank you for sh sharing uh, your experience, your achievement. Uh, this is uh, really useful for us. Um, my question is that uh, I want to ask you guys, uh, how important is uh, uh, functional programming? Because uh, I see that if uh, we write down our script with uh, the traditional uh, style like procedure or ob object-oriented programming, uh, if uh, they are good enough, why do we need to use functional programming uh, to uh, speed <laughs> up our uh, performance? Uh, is the first question. Uh, yes. I okay, okay. Second question. <laughs> I'm writing. <laughs> uh, second question is that uh, do you intend the, to uh, integrate your uh, model, your um, achievement into a rare or commercial website like uh, uh, Yandex Market? As you guys know that uh, if um, in the Yandex Market we have a HR function like uh, uh, evaluate uh, the product when we buy or sell thing. So that's uh, very cool. Uh, yeah, this is the second question. Uh, the third question is that uh, <laughs> when we uh, collaborate with X at, uh, uh, do we need to find a um, partner who have a different strength than uh, we are? Is that uh, true? Yeah, this is my question. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So the first question was it's about, about fu functional. functional. Okay. I mean, functional programming doesn't uh, improve the speed of your solution. It only improves how you can uh, maintain your solution. Because uh, you declare, you know, as I have said, you must be lazy. So you first de <laughs> declare the operations as you would. It's very similar to how neural networks work uh, like right now. You first create your ar architecture and then you apply data to this architecture. And this is the same idea, but used to more with this uh, traditional libraries like scikit-learn and uh, um, maybe, maybe TensorFlow is not uh, traditional, but uh, you can see that uh, it's not about the speed of your solution. It's how m well you can ma maintain all those blocks and how well you can maintain, you know, abstract away the uh, unnecessary details in your implementation. So, I mean, if th th this answers your question, uh, right. 
The second thing I yeah, was yeah, another point so about this functional approach. So what, what does it allow? So first we in this case we the data set, the test data set was really big, so uh, it was much easier if we could create a vectorizer object and apply it on batches of train mm -hmm. of test set. So we don't get out of memory error if we mm -hmm. apply uh, it on the like on the full uh, test and also it more easily allows like for for example to cache the features all the features and so on so it just simplified a lot and you know, thanks Paul, for organizing it uh, really properly <laughs> <laughs> in our code <laughs> because I don't do that usually <laughs> and the third one was about uh, applying uh, this uh the second one was ah, about commercial yeah. use yeah. of the models right uh, if you have a commercial use, just uh, call us. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, it's it would be very nice to do. I think uh, one 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 thing that uh, we were lacking in this uh, uh, competition was was really picture pictures, right, of the item. And I think pictures would improve uh, the solution. Uh, this is my intuition, and only because uh, it was a code competition with some very uh, large constraints. Uh, one hour uh, computation time. They didn't uh, uh, gave us. Uh, they didn't give us uh, the pictures. So I think uh, commercial application could really uh, profit from having pictures uh, in the data set. And the third question. Yeah, was about the uh, different uh, like different backgrounds when merging. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really important. And so before merging, I was not sure that our backgrounds are really different because like. From the number of submissions and from the like the way that Pavel was improving, I suspected that like <laughs> he is a good uh, software developer and he like uh, and we might have similar models and in fact we did have like our best models were quite similar but at the end it turned out really nice that like we worked on different parts so I didn't do any feature engineering at all and uh, Pavel suggested a lot of model ideas but I implemented them so I think it was mm -hmm. a nice nice split. And yeah, and as an example, like um, I think there were examples when mm, like people merged, but it turned out they invented the same magic feature, discovered the same magic mm -hmm. feature, and it didn't allow them to gain much from uh, from merging. Yes, and, and, and as so for we lucky, yeah. yes, as for the team collaboration, I just insist on you finding uh, some teammates. Uh, just to, you know, because it's a very nice experience if you can work uh, together on some problem, and uh, uh, if it works, uh, you you can get a lot more than just uh, winning uh, the competition. Like I, you can get a friend, <laughs> and uh, it's it's very important to to you know work in teams because it's uh, it's much much more fun uh, to to collaborate with someone. So please form teams if you can. So. <laughs> That's so? GitHub links. Yeah, so I think w what we can do is post to the competition forum and to Open Data Science yes, Slack. Yes. Will this work? Uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> and I can also give the link to you directly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah, so sorry that we didn't update the slides to include it. Okay, <laughs> last question. Oh, two, two questions. <laughs> oh, oops, sorry. Oh, hi, my name is George. Uh, could you please comment uh, for to Uruguay's leader approach? Uh, as I know, uh, this method used to uh, time series data. data. Uh, how did you uh, use this approach in this task? It's uh, enough. Thank you. So I think so. M maybe I pronounced it wrong. So I think this method uh, F R T F T R L F T R L method. So it was introduced in a paper in 2013 by in a Google paper that. Uh, applied it to uh, add click prediction and to factorization machines. So I, I'm personally not like I don't know much about it, but I think it's uh, and I don't know what is like the main idea. Maybe Paul, maybe you know. No, no. We we uh, eventually we didn't use uh, this model in our solution. So we only knew about this from the forum. We knew that uh, it worked for other teams, but we just couldn't find uh, the use. For uh, for this uh, approach, 
So maybe you're right that uh, it's not really the best uh, here. Okay. okay, thank you.